Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, uh, starting at verse number 1, and we're interested in verses 8 through 17, but I want to read verses 1 through 17 so that it can undergird or, or give context perhaps look as best as we can with the time given to verses 8 through 17 so I want to read verses 1 through 7 and then 8 through 17 so Genesis chapter 9 verses 1 through 17 it says then God blessed Noah and his sons saying to them be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Verse 6 says, whoever sheds human blood... By humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase up on it. Verse number 8, here's where we're going. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you. And with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that was with you. The birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals. All those that came out of the ark with you. Every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Verse 12 reads, And God said, This is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, verse 15 says, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Verse 17, our closing verse. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Let all of God's people say amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You could be seated in God's presence. Thank you, Jesus. If you didn't get a bulletin, uh, perhaps you can get one from our ushers. If you didn't get one on your way in, uh, you can get one. I, I won't be reading from it, but last week uh, we dealt with the opening of a group of messages dealing with biblical covenants. Uh, and this is the second part 
uh, in a series of, of messages uh, that we'll be preaching or teaching, dealing with uh, biblical covenants. And so you'll need uh, last week's, if you weren't here, just to give you some, a foundation um, that we're going to build upon today. And last week we dealt with uh, understanding biblical covenants and how the concept of covenant forms the overall structural backdrop of scripture. And so each time God entered into a covenant with someone, uh, it moved his redemptive plan forward in a dramatic way. And so we defined a covenant and we talked about it's a chosen relationship in which two parties make binding promises or obligations to each other. We said the purpose of a covenant is to establish parameters of an intimate relationship. Every intimate relationship must have parameters. It must have some yeses and some noes, some do's and some don'ts. Uh, even with all the freedom that you have, there has to be some boundaries to everything. Anything without boundaries will allow anything to come in. And so there must be uh, some parameters and covenants establish parameters. And so we said uh, some of those, some of the biblical characters, uh, they're described as righteous. You'll see that in Noah's account today. And some of them had unique relationships with God. Abraham was called a friend of God. David was called a man after God's own heart. Noah's called righteous, as we'll deal with um, Although they had these unique relationships with God and some of them had these unique titles uh, with God, we want to be clear that the covenants that God enters into with these individuals are not based on their merit. They're not based on anything they've done. They are based on God's goodness and his grace and his mercy. And he alone entering into covenant with these people. Uh, and it is based in God's faithfulness. Amen. Amen. We talked about if we're, going to, if we're going to study covenants, you have to study some of the characteristics. And I listed off a bunch of things last week, and I told you to write them down, but I was talking so fast, so I wrote them down for you today. So you can get all that uh, in your bulletin. So last week we dealt with the Adamic covenant uh, with Adam, and we talked about uh, how when it was all said and done, God issues Adam uh, 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 issues, he's talking to Satan, but nonetheless, there's a promise that he gives, and Adam and Eve, I'm sure they're there, maybe they overheard it, maybe they didn't, I don't know, but there's a promise given that there would be a seed to come that would crush the head of Satan and evil and sin and death and condemnation and all those things uh, that come with evil, and so he says, there is a seed coming. No matter what. And we closed on that uh, topic or that uh, idea or that thought. And so there should be a no matter what aspect to all of our covenants. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm going slow on purpose. Just wait on me. There should be a no matter what aspect to all of our covenants. All of our covenants should have some kind of element of no matter what. When God uh, issued this promise to Satan and he was in covenant with Adam, he said, this is what I'm going to do no matter what. Amen. And so all of our covenants should have that to say, this is what you're going to get from me no matter what. Probably the uh, first thing that comes to mind with us is marriage because marriage is entering into covenant. Uh, in your marriage relationships, there should be some aspect of no matter what, this is what you're going to get from me. No matter what, ladies, this is what you're going to get from me. I'm going to respect you no matter what. Fellas, this is what you're going to get from me. I'm going to love you and speak to you and communicate with you and listen to your emotions no matter what. Why would I say those things? Because those are the two primary love languages of a man and a woman. Men, we speak in the language of respect. I don't care what you're saying. If you don't say it in a respectful way to a man... Nine times out of ten, you've lost him. Same thing with women. When, when they listen, they, they want you to listen for emotional reasons, not to problem solve. They want to connect emotionally. And so that's one of their needs. And so no matter what, this is what I'm going to do. Even if she does disrespect me, 
I'm not going to disrespect her because I entered into this covenant and that aspect of the covenant I'm going to keep no matter what. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Now this isn't a, a relationship teaching, but I just figured since marriage is probably the, the, the biggest or the most obvious uh, covenant in our society today, um, uh, we can use that as an example. There are three aspects of that Adamic covenant that, that still remain. Remember we said when we talk about or study covenants, we have to study uh, continuity and discontinuity. What, what is done away with as a result of the new covenant that God is, is, is issuing now and what continues on. And so I gave that to you in your notes and your bulletin. I said there are at least three things that continue after Adam's covenant. The Sabbath, labor, and marriage. And so uh, we may observe them in a way that looks different, but, but nonetheless, we are, um, they were instituted at creation, and we continue in those. Amen? Amen. Amen. Are you brought up to speed? Amen. Amen. And so we ended last week with Adam, and I think it's important to build a bridge from Adam to Noah um, if we're going to understand what's happening here in this Noahic covenant. Uh, remember, we said when we study covenants, the primary or the first thing we should do is study the context. What was going on? What was happening when this covenant was instituted, when God went into covenant with this individual? And so last week, we ended with Adam. And Adam is very interesting because Adam functioned, watch me here, Adam functioned as a representative of all mankind. Adam functioned as a representative of all mankind. There's a term that people use to, or theologians use to describe him. They say, Adam, watch, is a covenant head. He's a covenant head. Covenantal headship. Or another word for it is federal headship. Same term, but talking about the same thing. Synonymous terms. Adam functions as a covenant head. And covenant headship or federal headship is a relationship in which an individual represents a larger group of people. And the actions of that individual or that representative are imputed onto the larger group. When someone functions as a covenant head, it's when that individual represents a larger group of people and that individual's actions, his obedience, his disobedience or her, his or her obedience or disobedience, their actions are representative. They represent the entire group or the larger group. That's called covenant headship. The Bible deals with this in a couple of places in Romans chapter 5. Uh, specifically verses 12 through 21. We won't turn there, but just throwing it out if you want to read it. And it deals with this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22. I like 1 Corinthians 15 because it says in Adam. That's dealing with covenant headship. In Adam. In other words, it's saying in Adam all died. Why? Because Adam was the covenant head. And because of this one coveted head's disobedience, sin is now transferred or imputed onto everybody. Now, the Bible does not uh, let us know exactly how that happens, exactly how that transference takes place. But it does let us know that there is a transfer. Because the covenant head messed up, now everyone who comes out of him and her are now subject to sin and death. Because he is the covenant head. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 15, uh, we all died through one man's trespass. Through one man's trespass, everyone died because he is the covenant head, the federal head. And to make it make more sense, there are, there's covenantal headship in various relationships that we have today. We, we have to dance between each individual having their own responsibility, 
But at the same time, the concept or the idea of covenant headship is still true. You can have covenantal headship, watch me here, in your marriage relationships. Covenantal headship. You can have covenantal headship in your family relationships where the father or the man or even mothers, single mothers, parents, or as couples, you function together as covenant heads. And the decisions you make as the covenant head determine what happens in your family. Joshua said it like this, when they got through reading the Mosaic Covenant after they had entered the promised land and they had won all of the battles and they were, had a few more they had to fight but they were divvying out all the land and they were reading the law or the Mosaic Covenant when it was all said and done, Joshua said, as covenant head from my house, he said it like this, you maybe know it like this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's saying, as the covenant head of my home, as of my tribe, of my clan, I, I, however you want to say it, he said, I can't speak for everybody, but as long as I'm alive and willing and able, as covenant head, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, how does that look in, in a New Testament or New Covenant context? I'm reminded of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. The Bible says when he got saved, he says just because, because he received the message, it opened the door for the message to be preached to his entire family. And the Bible says today God will save you, watch this, and your household. Because you as covenant head made the decision to invite Jesus into your life. Now you've opened the door as a covenant head for your family to receive Jesus. It happens again in Acts chapter 16. The Philippian jailer, they preached the message to him. And then he says, come home and preach it to my family. And the same promise is issued to him. He says, God is going to save you and your entire household. Why? Because of covenantal headship. They still have to make the decision for themselves. But his decision as the covenant head Open the door for others to hear the message. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's covenant headship. You and I as a church, why did I go on that long soliloquy or message? You and I, watch this, are covenant heads of the neighborhood. The neighborhood is not in covenant with God. But the church of Jesus Christ, not the Latter-day Saints. The Christian church is in covenant with God. And so as covenant heads of the region, of the neighborhood, of the city that we're in, there's only so much that we should allow as covenant heads. This is why when it really hits the fan, God doesn't talk and deal with everybody else. I don't need to talk to everybody else. I just need to talk to who I am in covenant with. So when it hit the fan, Adam, where are you? Because I need to talk to the covenant head. The Bible says it like this. We quote this, and I'm not sure we really truly mean what it's saying. We say things like, America's going to hell. They've allowed so many things, abortion and gay marriage and all of these unjust laws and greed and all of these things. All of these sinners out there are going to hell. Actually, that's not truly how it functions. The Bible says the healing of the land is not based on them. But it's based on who? The covenant head. He says, if my people who are called by my name, I don't need to talk to them. I just need to talk to who I'm in covenant with. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. I didn't say the Republicans. I didn't say the Democrats. I didn't say those who are having abortions. I didn't say Wall Street. I didn't say Silicon Valley. I said my people who I'm in covenant with have a responsibility for the healing of the land. I would say that what's happening in our nation 
is an outgrowth of what's happening in the body of Christ. We can get the body of Christ to do a lot of things, but, but if, we get, if we call for the body of Christ to come together and pray, I'm, I'll bet my bottom dollar that's our smallest meeting. That's our smallest group. That's our smallest gathering. Not because of them, but because of the people he's in covenant with. And so each time something happened in the nation, you'll see this throughout the Old Testament. He would come to them and say, you broken covenant with me. And as covenant head, I need to speak with you. And so Adam functioned as the covenant head. And because the covenant head, whether you know it or not, I'm going to save the shout for just a few weeks. Because if you understand how big covenant headship is. It, it, it would just blow your mind because we're sitting here because of covenant headship, but we'll deal with that uh, in the first week in August. But nonetheless, covenant headship, he says, Adam sinned and broke God's command. He didn't have a lot of them. He just had one. He just says, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I've given you everything else, but don't eat from the tree. Adam and Eve, we know the story goes, they eat from the tree. And all of a sudden, something breaks out like they can't even imagine. And this is the deadliness. The Bible describes it this way. This is the deadliness of, of sin. It's so deadly. It's so ugly. It's so nasty. It's so perverse. I mean, it's sin. It's just the most disgusting, ugly thing. And I want us to begin to see it that way. I pray. I said, God, let me start hating what you hate. Let me start seeing it the way you see it. Let me find it disgusting the way you find it disgusting. Let me not be able to allow certain things in my presence the same way you don't like certain things in your presence. It seems so disgusting. All of a sudden, it breaks out. And it breaks out in Adam's family. This is why covenant headship is so important. You determine the direction of your family. Uh, if you heard these statistics, I believe it's uh, if, if, if a woman in the household accepts Jesus, that household is like 17 to 20% uh, more likely to accept Jesus as a family. Uh, when a father accepts Jesus in a household that, watch this, that family is between 80 and 90 plus percent more likely to accept Jesus because the covenant head did. Covenant headship affects the family. And when the covenant head broke, the first place it broke out was in his family. Cain all of a sudden murders his brother Abel. And something seems to happen. You don't see it. The Bible doesn't uh, 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 explicitly say it, but it implicitly says it's implied. All of a sudden you see something break out. Can I just talk to you for a moment today? We may not shout today. I'm sorry. That was last week. But, 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 but can we just talk today? So in Genesis 3.15, God, uh, God is talking to Satan, and he says, I will put enmity between uh, you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And from that point forward, if you read close at the scriptures, you, you can kind of see a dividing line. Everybody's in sin. Don't get me wrong. We're going to find out in just a little bit. But, but you kind of see a dividing line. All of a sudden, you see Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Watch this. The Bible says that Cain belonged to the evil one. You'll see it in a few places. Uh, Jesus says it in John 8, verse number 44. He, he says he was, a, he was talking about Satan. He says he was a murderer from the beginning. 
I like to think that he functioned through Cain in another uh, through Cain in another place. First John chapter three, verse number twelve. It says specifically that Cain belonged to the evil one. So it would seem like Satan has this seed or these group of people that he's able to use. Now, does he override their ability to choose? Absolutely not. How do we know? Because God comes to Cain and he appeals to him and he says, you still have a choice. He says, sin is crouching at your door, but you must master it. You still have a choice in the matter. Don't allow the enemy to use you. He warns him, but the enemy uses him. And all of a sudden, you see Cain uh, kills his brother Abel, and he has offspring. And you go down through the line. I don't want to go through his whole line. We don't have time. But then you go down through the line, and you'll see there's an individual by the name of Lamech. And Lamech is the first person in the Bible that has uh, multiple wives. And so he's the first person in scripture that we see that engages uh, in polygamy. And he has these women in slavery under his neck. And so uh, he's very boastful and proud in his words. That's a whole other study for another day. But if you read it, he's very boastful and arrogant and proud. And all of a sudden you see the outgrowth on Cain's side. Then you get to Eve's side. And, 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 and you see that Cain kills his brother Abel. I tend to think that the enemy is starting the work of trying to kill every seed. Because keep in mind, God promises him there's a seed coming to crush your head. He doesn't know who it is. He doesn't know who, what, when, or where. So he goes on a murderous rampage. He, he says, let me go after Abel. He may be the one that will kill the seed. Let me go after Abraham and Sarah. They may carry the seed. Let me go after Isaac and Rebekah. They may carry the seed. Let me go after Jacob and Rachel. They may carry the seed. And you see this attack. Of barrenness, all in an attempt to attack the sea. And so I tend to believe that, that the enemy tried to work through Cain to kill the sea. But God had a plan. He says, though you killed Abel, I'll grant her another son by the name of Seth. And through Seth, the, 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 the bloodline continues. And now the redemptive seed is still in the earth. Whatever you do, maybe do it for your own Bible study. Don't lose track of the seed. Follow the seed down through scripture. You may get lost in a few places, but, but, but the Bible will pick up in the New Testament where you get lost. And it will help you to trace the seed. Whatever you do, don't lose track of the seed. And so you have to follow the seed. It goes down to Seth. Seth has some children, and we can't go through everybody, but in his line, I believe it's his great, great, great grandson, he gives birth to Enoch. And the Bible says Enoch walked so closely with God that he didn't even die. Glory to God. He was just taken up. Isn't God good? There's a blessing when you walk close to him. I don't know how many people are still being taken up, but I'm just saying. He walked with God so close where God says, don't even pass through the portal of death. Let me just take you on. And Enoch walks with God, and he is taken up, I believe, at the age of 365 years old. After Enoch, there comes another individual, if I can find it. After Enoch, there comes uh, Methuselah. Methuselah, the Bible says he lived 969 years. 
The oldest person in all of scripture lives 969 years. I can imagine people thinking Enoch has to be the one carrying the seed because he walked so close with God. God takes him away. Okay, not Enoch. It has to be Methuselah. It has to be him. He, he's almost a thousand years old. He almost lives a full millennium. Surely he carries the seed. He must be immortal somehow. But Methuselah dies. So Methuselah is not carrying the seed. Methuselah has a child by the name of Lamech. And this is not the Lamech that descends from Cain. It's another Lamech. You will find that many of the names are similar. They are very close. You can hear it in the English, but you can really see it in the original language. I don't know if they were starting naming conventions, if they were starting to name people based on certain things. You know how we have a junior and a third and the fourth, but there seemed to be some type of naming pattern. But this Lamech is not Cain's Lamech. This Lamech is the Lamech that descends from Seth. And the Bible says Lamech at 182 years old is tired. You see the outgrowth of Adam's decision. Lamech is tired. How do we know Lamech is tired? Because when he gives birth to his son Noah, he names him, he says, perhaps you will bring us comfort. From all our toil, since God has cursed the ground. So it doesn't even take long. I haven't got to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. By the time we get to Genesis 5, everybody's tired. Everybody's seeking rest from all of the toil, all of the heartache, from working the soil and working the ground. I can imagine their fingers having thorns in them, thorns that weren't there some time ago. But now life is getting harder and harder and tougher and tougher. This is what happens when you exit covenant. Oh, glory to God. Things become harder. They become tougher. Or you may say, well, Pastor Gabriel, I've been in covenant with God and things have been tough. But yeah, when you walk with God, he renews your strength. He keeps you in the fight. You can take a licking and keep on ticking. When everybody else gets tired because I'm in covenant with God, something keeps me going. The Bible says they that hope in the Lord, wait on the Lord, shall renew their strength. There's a renewal I get because I'm in covenant with God. His spirit comforts me and leads me into all truth. Though the outward man wasteth away, the inward man is being renewed day by day. This is why I got to get here on Sunday morning. There's a renewal that takes place. This is why I can't sit in my house, sit in my apartment, and watch football. I get renewed when I get here. I don't care what I'm facing. I don't care what has happened all week. When I hear the songs being sung to the Lord and voices being lifted up, something just comes alive in me. When you're in covenant with God, he renews your strength. So Lamech is tired. There's this toil that's taking place. All of this are, is the outgrowth of Adam's decision. The curse is now being manifest through the book of Genesis. I hope you see it like I see it in my mind. That, 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 that we're exiting out of this period of innocence and now all hell is breaking loose. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6 and Noah is on the earth, God makes one of the saddest declarations in all of scripture. I wish I had one time just to do a series on the saddest verses in all of scripture so you don't miss them. But this would probably be near the top of my list. In Genesis 6 verse number 5 it says, And God saw that man's thoughts, his acts, his ideas were evil all the time. 
And God saw that man's intentions, his acts, his thoughts, his motivations were evil. One translation says continually. There's no hope. There there's, no, seems to be no idea, no way that man is going to get any better. Sin has now touched everything. The, if I had time to deal with the sons of God and the daughters of men, how the sons of God and the daughters of men are now intermingling, things are taking place. Hell is breaking loose. Perhaps you don't look around you. Let's make it applicable to today. Perhaps you don't look around and see that hell is breaking loose. Oh, yeah, I'm holding on to his unchanging hand, but I'm not blind. I can look around and see what in the world. Do you ever just sit and listen to the news sometime and look at your social media feed and see the stories that are taking place? Because the curse has been unleashed. It's touched everything and everybody. When the covenant head took a knee, everything that came from him had to bow to sin and death and condemnation. Can I just go a little further in the story? So God says, we're in Genesis 6 now. We dealt with 4, 3, 4, and 5. God says in Genesis 6, I got to do something. And whatever you do, you remember, try to remember the major turning points in scripture. The major turning points, Genesis 1, a turning point, creation. Genesis 3, a turning point, a promise of salvation. Genesis 6, the flood, a major turning point. And God instructs Noah, I need you to build an ark. And build it. With this many rooms and this big, in our context today, it would be the size, the length of one and a half football fields. About 450 feet long, a big boat. And I need you to build this boat, you and your family, your sons and their wives. And I want you to go inside of this boat. And I want you to be there. I know it's going to look funny now, but I know you're going to look strange now. Because up to this point, if you look at the story closely, rain has not come from the sky. God watered the earth from the ground up, not from the top down. But he says, for this, I am going to open open all of the floodgates. Water will come from the bottom. Water will fall from the top. Water is going to come from everywhere. And you're going to look strange building the ark now. But just listen and do what I say. Oh, glory to God. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse number 7, and Noah built this ark by faith. And it is because Noah does this by faith. If, oh, if you don't get anything else, you better get this. You don't need all of the instructions about everything. Just go with what God has given you. He says, I'm not giving you everything. I'm just telling you to build what I told you to build and do what I told you to do. You don't know nothing about Jesus yet. You don't know nothing about the Virgin Mary yet. You don't know nothing about Joseph yet. But here's what I'll do. I'll credit you righteousness because you believed based on what you knew. Stop waiting for all of the information before you believe. I'll believe when I see. I'll believe when I get the business plan. I'll believe when the money comes through. I'll believe when there's provision. It can, oh, glory to God. Is there anybody that can just go in what God has said? If he told you to go, go. You may not have it now, but between your going and your coming, it will be there. I hear somebody in my spirit saying, who will roll the stone away? Any resurrection Christians in the house, but go ahead and walk on down to the tomb. Between your walking, the stone will be rolled away. And the Bible says that Noah starts building by faith. And it is because of this faith that God credits him righteousness. Glory to God. 
Noah just wasn't righteous because he was a great guy. It is because he put his faith in what God has said. See, you just can't read the story. What you should do in your personal study is then go look up the name and see where they uh, show up throughout various places in the Bible and piece all of the parts and places together. In John 8, 1 John 3, uh, Hebrew eleven seven, 7, piece the story together. Where the Bible is silent, you be silent. But where the Bible gives direction, the Bible says that Noah believed God and he started building this ark by faith. Yes, sir. And because he put his faith in God's progressive plan. I shouldn't have to go over that again if you've been listening in the last year. Yeah, his progressive plan. The steps. It's a progressive plan. He's not going to work it all at once. It's a progressive plan. Each generation. See, they didn't know that. I'm sure they were looking for the seed in every generation in Genesis, thinking when God promised the seed, it's going to be like next week. I'm sure they didn't recognize two, three thousand years later it would take place, but they had to follow God's progressive plan. I want to talk to somebody who's in the midst of a progressive plan. It doesn't look like what God said, but it's a progressive plan. It may not even happen in your generation, but it's a progressive plan. Your children may see it. Your grandchildren may see it. Your great-grandchildren may see it, but it's a progressive plan. Touch somebody and say it's a progressive plan. Slap that other neighbor behind you and say it's a progressive plan. Turn to that third person and say, now work the steps. Work the steps. Just a step at a time. It's a progressive plan. You're still on probation, but it's a progressive plan. You still got your business plan, but it's a progressive plan. You don't have the money yet, but you got the idea. It's a progressive plan. Your marriage isn't all the way out of the fire, but he's talking to you this week. It's a progressive plan. This is why you got to learn to thank God for the steps. Not for the whole thing, but start thanking God for the step. The steps of a good man are ordered. I just thank God for the step. St. John is in everything that is going to be, but I see steps. I squint and I see you and I see steps. I see where we're going. I don't see it all, but I see enough for the next step. His word is a lamp unto my feet. He just shines a light for the next step. So because he put his faith in the progressive plan, God grants him righteousness. Bible says Noah was righteous among others in his journey. It didn't say he was perfect. It says he was righteous. Because on the other side of our covenant that we read today in chapter 9, there's some things that happen <laughs> that are a little less than righteous. But nonetheless, he credits Noah as righteous. Noah is called righteous in the scriptures and he builds this ark and they go in. And it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you haven't read the story for yourself, I hope you do, you can make the mistake of assuming that they were only in there 40 days because you've probably heard of rain 40 days and 40 nights. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. But they spend more than a year locked inside of this heart. And the Bible says, God says, go into the ark. And the Bible's very clear. And God shut the door. That's a whole nother sermon by itself. The Bible's very clear. It's a, and God himself shut the door. You just get you, your family, all the animals in. But God's going to shut the door. Glory to God. I wish you could see the parallels. See, right now we're just coming in and going out and the door's still open, but there's going to come a day that the door is going to close. Pastor Gabriel's not going to close it. Apostle's not going to close it. Bishop so-and-so isn't going to close it. But there's going to be a day where God is going to shut the door. 
So I suggest you get in the ark while the door is open. Because there's going to come a day when the door is going to close. And it ain't going to be my mama was saved, my grandmama was saved. I went to church every now and then. I ushered out the door every now and then. I know about two and a half scriptures. When the door closes, God's going to shut the door. And everything on the outside of the door. I got to go. So the Bible says the flood comes. And all of a sudden, you go through the flood. And after the flood is where we'll pick up with our covenant. After the flood. The flood's over. And all of a sudden, if you look close, you will see some things are very, very similar. You would almost think I tell you this all the time, but if you squint while you read the scripture, you feel like, is that Noah or is that Adam? Because their experiences seem to be just alike. Is that Noah or is that Adam? What's, what's, what? Adam, Noah, who, who is that? Adam, Noah, who is that? Because the Bible says as they come out, the waters have receded. They've gone down and out of these waters, God says, now start the work of a new beginning. Where have I seen this before? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over what? The waters. I've seen this before where now a man and woman God brings creation out of a watery chaos and coming out of a watery chaos he comes to Noah and his wives and his sons and his family and he says I want you to continue the same work. And the covenant that I had with Adam, now I want to have that covenant with you. Because if you read the wording close, he doesn't say I'm going to cut a new covenant with you. He says I want to establish my covenant now with you. The one I had with your forefather, now I want to enter into that and establish that covenant with you. So out of this watery chaos, I charge you, Noah. Be fruitful and multiply and increase in number. The same charge that I gave to Adam, I'm now giving to you. Be fruitful and multiply and increase in number. Just like Adam was charged with naming all of the animals, now the animals come out of the ark with you and they are charged to propagate all over the earth and multiply as it was with Adam, Noah, so it is now with you. says be fruitful and multiply and increase in number he says with this covenant this is important it may not be now but it's a step until we get to the big one and he says with this covenant let me establish what you're going to eat remember we told you about that there's about three four three or four of the six covenants where there are instructions on what you can eat. He says, where I instructed Adam to just eat vegetables and fruits, the vegetation. He was a vegetarian. He says, now I instruct you that you can eat animals. But here's what I want you to do. Don't eat any animal that has its lifeblood still in it. Glory to God. I wish I had some Bible readers in the house that understood how huge. Don't eat any animal. We're coming out of the ark now. So everything he says is important. God doesn't mince. He doesn't waste any words. Everything he says, listen to everything he said. When he does speak, listen to everything that he says. Be fruitful and multiply. Let the ants flow, I mean, let the animals flow throughout the earth. Do that. But here, you can now eat everything. Don't eat meat with this lifeblood still in it. And what 
God was doing was establishing from the very beginning the sanctity of blood. Oh. He's establishing the sanctity of blood. This is not the first time he does it. How do we know? Because in Genesis 4, when Cain kills Abel, what does he say? He says, listen, I hear what? His blood crying out from the ground. His blood is talking. There's a speaking agent. I dealt with that in years past. There's a speaking agent in blood. Blood does a lot of talking. Whether you know it or not, your blood speaks for you. Your natural physical blood speaks for you. If, if, if I draw your blood, it can tell me what you're susceptible to. It can tell me what you're allergic to. It can tell me what you should stay away from. It can tell me who you can give a transplant to because your blood talks for you. And he said, listen, Abel's blood is crying out from the ground. So I have to establish the sanctity of blood. It may not make sense now. It'll come just in the little steps. I tell one generation to sprinkle blood around the altar. I tell another one to offer sacrifices. But sooner or later, you will see the sanctity of blood. It may not make sense now, but by the time we get to Calvary, you'll recognize the sanctity. This is why you follow God's instructions. The instruction may come now, but understanding may come later. So he says, don't eat meat with blood still in it. Drain the blood out. That spiritually, also naturally, all of the illnesses that come with eating blood. He says, so drain the blood out. These are my instructions. And this is what I've called you to do. He says, I've provided all of this for you. And I can imagine Noah standing there before the God, perhaps before God on Mount Ararat. I don't know where they are. Perhaps at this point he's down on the ground and God is talking to him. He's standing there listening to God, standing before God. And I can imagine after everything, he says, I've given you dominion just like I gave to Adam. I'll put fear of you in the animals. So these animals will be afraid of you. You'll be able to hunt them for food. I, 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 you're the crown of my creation. I place you above everything else. These are my instructions for you. God, that's all well and good. But I can imagine if I'm like Noah, if Noah's any way like me, in the back of my mind, he had to be thinking, what if this happens again? There's something that happens when you survive stress or when you survive something traumatic. We're going to be dealing with this on one Wednesday night with Dr. James just a little bit. There's something that happens after major traumatic events. It can lead to stress disorders. We call them post-traumatic stress disorders. And and right now, everyone's trying to study the post-pandemic stress disorders. There are things people are having right now that are stress disorders just from the pandemic. There are people that I know that are close to me. They say, listen to the science, listen to the science, listen to the science. Till the science disagrees with what they think. And then they say, I'm still going to do what I'm going to do because it's a stress disorder. People will still not come into crowds right now. Because of a stress disorder. I'm not saying be unsafe. I'm not saying walk around with your mask on. But I'm saying how long? Will it take till you return to what you, how long before you go to the movies again? How long before you gather in crowds of hundreds of people again? How long? Why? Because stress disorders, the trauma, the fear of what could happen constantly in their minds. What happened back then? I can imagine Noah 
Oh, glory to God. I'm closing here. Standing before God and God making all of these promises. Be fruitful and multiply. All of these declarations. I've given you dominion just like I gave them dominion. I, 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 you can go and you can eat. I've given you provision. Eat vegetables. Eat fruits. Eat all of the meat you want. But God, you've dealt with everything. But you haven't dealt with the fear that's on the inside of me. That says, what if this happens again? Has anybody ever lived through something and it calls you to ask the question, what if this happens again? I got to close and I'm done. I got three minutes and I'm out. What if this Ooh, happens again? I believe I'm talking to some what if this happens again type of people. You're afraid to walk into your next marriage or your next relationship because you're saying, what if this? happens again you're afraid to go into your next business deal because you crashed in the last time what if this happens again I'm afraid to make my next move thank you brother I know you'll be real has anybody ever had some failures I'll raise my hand and say I've made some dumb decisions I've lost thousands of dollars I've had lights off and heat off and furnaces broken and depending on stove what if this happens again. Have you ever been in trouble so long where you start thinking, are we ever going to get out of this? And if we do experience something good, something is holding you back from experiencing it all the way because the whole time you're experiencing this, you're wondering, will it ever crash again? Can I talk to some real Christians this morning? That say, Pastor Gabriel, I want to make a move, but if I'll be real, this is to dap me up every week. I love it. If I'll be real, I'm afraid to make that next step because the last time I stepped out on the water, I began to sink and I drowned. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out of the boat again. Pastor Gabriel, the last time I was with that man or that woman, they beat me pretty bad. I'm not able to trust again like I used to. And it's affecting my next relationship. And now I have a good man, a good woman, but something on the inside of me says, what if this happens again? Glory to God. I'm in my new apartment. I bought all of my furniture on credit, but, but now I'm dependent on this job and if they lay me off I lose the apartment and everything in it so I really can't really rest because I have a fear of what if this happens again oh glory to God I'll be real can I put myself on the stand there are decisions I know need to be made with this church but in the back of my mind I'm thinking what if this happens again what if this happens again what if this person goes home to be with the Lord what if this person leaves the church what if my father dies what if this happens again and there could be a fear that robs you of everything that God has for you. There could be a fear that robs you for a blessing that's on the other side of the flood because I've come to announce to you this morning that there is a blessing on the other side of the flood. Slap somebody and say there's a blessing on the other side of this. Slap that other neighbor and say, neighbor, there's a blessing on the other side of this. Everything that you survive, everything that you walk through, everything that you've gone through, there's a blessing on the other side of this. Reggie, there's a blessing on the other side of it. There's a blessing on the other side of it, Mr. Duncan. Somebody
somebody stretch their hands and begin to pray for this man and tell you there's a blessing on the other side of it. It may look like a burden, but it's a blessing. He may take something away, but it's a blessing. There's a blessing on the other side of this. You don't know what some words mean to some people. It may not mean anything to you, but you don't know what some things mean to some people. Sometimes the only reason I came to church is just to hear just a little piece of a word that would tell me there's something on the other side of this. So Noah, standing before God, God making all of these declarations, all of these charges, all of these commands, be fruitful and multiply and increase in number. I'll put the fear and dread of you in the animals, allow them to move about throughout the earth. Go and let your family go this way and go that way to repopulate the earth. I can imagine him stepping out like Adam, looking around at the earth. But the only difference is, where Adam had experienced perfection, all Noah has known is sin and decay. And above all of that, there's now been a flood that has destroyed everybody. Imagine sitting inside of an ark with not very many windows. As a matter of fact, I believe if you read close, there's really only one small opening inside of the ark. And God gave him that so he could release the birds to see if there was life on the earth. Why would God not put a window inside of the ark? I can imagine Noah looking around and see some of his friends drowning. I can imagine him seeing all of the death and decay. But God says, I'm going to shield you from all of that. So don't put a window inside of the ark except where I instruct you to do so. But I can imagine he still heard the screams, the gargles of people drowning in the water. The judgment time had come. Sin had reached its full measure. And now a divine response was inevitable. God is loving. God is kind. God is strong. But God is just. And the Bible says, well, not the just judge of all the earth do rights. So if he drowned everybody, I have to rest in the fact that the perfect judge stands before the earth as judge, jury, and executioner. And my righteous judgments are correct. I've given you an opportunity to change the choice that was in Cain. I now give to you, but you refused. You stood by day and night. And you watch Noah put piece of wood together after piece of wood together. You watched him put the, oh glory to God, the roof on the boats. And yet you didn't change. You watched him lay the foundation of the boats. And yet you didn't change. You watched him gather all the food for the animals. But yet you didn't change. You watched him gather the food for his family. But yet you didn't change. I've given you an opportunity. But now the sin has reached its full measure. And judgment must be emptied out. And so the flood waters covered the earth. Imagine the screams of man, woman, and children. Imagine the animals outside of the ark. Imagine the ark 
crashing into mountains. Imagine the ark moving through the valleys and there is no electricity. So imagine darkness throughout the ark. You don't see anything. You can't see much. But all that you see in here is just a few animals and families and the people screaming outside of the ark. I can imagine Noah standing before God saying, I hear all of your promises. I hear all of your charges. I hear all of your instructions. But there's just one more thing that I need. And God says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. And the same covenant I had with Adam, I'll have with you. But now I'll take my covenant one step further. Let me put a rainbow in the sky. And every time that you see that rainbow, let you be reminded that I'll never do that thing again. I may move in a different way, but that way shall never happen again. I want to prophesy to somebody in the room. You took some losses, and there are still some losses to come. That's a part of the human experience. But there are some things that you'll never go through again. I declare it over your life that there are some losses that you'll never take again. I declare over your life that there are some battles that you'll never fight again. What did you say, Moses? The Egyptians you see today, you shall never see them again. There's something that's been chasing you, but you'll never see it again. There's something that tried to overtake you, but you'll never experience it again. There's some losses that you took, but you'll never lose that again. Slap that neighbor, high five that neighbor, and say, neighbor, help him preach. Tell that neighbor, you might have took some losses, but you'll never take that one again. Touch that neighbor, lean on him, and say, you'll never experience that again. I don't know what your that is. I don't know what your that is. I don't know what your flood is, but you'll never experience that flood again. Somebody in the room is getting free from domestic violence right now. Today is your day. You gonna walk away and you're never gonna allow a man to hit you again. Somebody in this room is being free from debt bondage and that debt will never hit you again. You may take some else, but it won't happen like it did before. God has set a rainbow in the sky and Noah, I give you my guarantee that what you went through, you'll never experience that ever again. Somebody in the room, begin to open up your mouth and praise God that you survived something that you'll never go through again. Never again, never again, never again, never again, never again. I found it never again. I didn't have a title to this message, but I said, Holy Spirit, I'll walk with you until you give it to me. I think we done stumbled up on it. Touch somebody and say never again. When you get to your neighbor's house, if they ask you what did he preach about, say he preached never again if you ask your mama and she say what did he talk about he talked about never again if somebody asks you 
while you're skipping down the highway. Just tell them because never again will I experience what I experience. There's some losses I'll never take. You're at an inflection point and you'll never go through that again. You survive the flood. Now begin to praise God that never, 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 Somebody's coming off a drug addiction right now. Never again. Somebody's being free from sex bondage. Never again. God covenants with Noah that never again you're going to have your trials you're going to have your losses I want you to hear that clear leaving here today but there are some things I can't go through every single person. You just got to recognize what he's saying to you. I just know what he said to me. There are some things never again. The enemies you see today, you will never see again. See, this word means different things to different people. You can't shout over what she's shouting over. You can shout over what you can shout over. Never again. And he says, I'll never do this again. So now for the rest of your years, Noah, as you work, you don't have to look over your shoulder wondering if things get bad enough again. Whenever I see rain coming from the sky, it could be a traumatic experience for me. But if you promise never again, I'll say this and I'm closing. This covenant is unique. Remember we said each one is unique in its own way. This one is unique among the other six, of the other five. Because this covenant is not redemptive. In this covenant, there's no redemption. But what this covenant does, it God says, I will provide yes. a stability yes. to everything I created. Yes. I want you to be fruitful and multiply and increase in number. I want the earth to grow, repopulate. Why? Because I have to provide an arena for me to enter into. Y'all just missed that. I have to stabilize it because one day I'm going to enter into it. And so although this covenant is not redemptive, it provides the arena for Jesus to enter into. 
So where the first covenant provided the promise of the seed, this one sets the arena and it stabilizes everything. Sin will be present. There will still be imperfection. There will be other storms. But you'll never have to worry about something being so big that it destroys the entire earth. Glory to God. He says, I'll set my rainbow in the sky. And if you look at that word rainbow, in the original language, it's just bow. As in a bow and arrow. In other words, God is saying, when you see that rainbow, let it be a sign and a signal to you that I have put away my weapons of war and everything that could destroy humanity. I'll hold it back until every promise that I've made comes to pass. This is what helps me to sleep at night because sometimes you wonder and you teeter on the fact, will we survive? Will the church survive? Will my family survive? Will that survive? And God spoke peace through this covenant and said, I'll hold back everything until everything I've declared about the church, about your family, about those connected to you come to pass. Everybody in this room, lift your hands. I declare this over your life. God will hold back everything, every curse, all evil, everything that was supposed to come against you if you walk in obedience to him. Noah was in obedience. And he says, I hold back everything. And I declare this over your life. May God hold back every work of the enemy every negative word, every word curse that was spoken out of somebody's mouth over you, your children, your grandchildren. When great grandmama got in a rage and got angry and said, you ain't nothing, ain't nobody in this family ever gonna be nothing. And that word curse tried to go down through the bloodline. It stops now in the name of Jesus. And every plan that God has over your family and your bloodline, May he hold back every evil until everything comes to pass over your life. In the name of Jesus, we declare it in Jesus' name that it is so. What's the, what's the fulfillment? I told you, remember when we're studying covenants, the last piece you should study is its fulfillment. Adam's seed was, or Eve's, the seed coming from Adam was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. What's the fulfillment of this covenant? We're the fulfillment. We're still here. That covenant has been fulfilled. He's not broken his promise until everything he declared in his word comes to pass. The earth shall remain. He says, I will never disrupt the natural order again. Summer and winter will come. Seed time and harvest will take place. And we're still here. This is why I have to balance because I believe in climate change. I separate with some of my Christian brothers and friends who don't, but I believe when you look throughout the world, you see climate change. I believe climate change is one of the signs of sin, one of the fallouts of sin in the earth. But what I don't believe 
is that the earth will somehow implode under the weight of climate change until Jesus returns and God fulfills everything that he said he would fulfill. So in the meantime, take care, care of the planet as best you can. But I recognize who's holding it all together. Never again. Put your hands together and give God praise for his word this morning. While these heads are bowed, while these heads are bowed and these eyes are closed, there's someone in the room or maybe perhaps you're watching online and you're outside of relationship with Jesus Christ and you want to enter into a relationship with him. We set aside this moment in our worship experience for you. Will you accept Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior? He died for you. That's what all these covenants are about. We're dealing with all the details, but at its core, all of these covenants have to do with Jesus coming and dying for you and for me. And when you accept him into your life, you live in covenant with him forever. We'll deal with all of the stipulations, all of the promises in a few weeks of the new covenant. We're just walking up to it now. But for right now, you don't need all of the details. We dealt with that. Just put your faith in what you know. You may not know Genesis to Revelation. You may not know all of the books of the Bible. I don't either. You may not know all of the scriptures. But you have enough faith. The Bible said he's given to each of us a measure of faith. You have enough faith right now to put your faith and your trust in what you know invite Jesus into your life. If you're watching online, you can direct message us. If you're watching via social media, whether it be Facebook, YouTube, you can type it into the comments. I want Jesus sent him in my life. Perhaps you want to go over to our website or maybe you're already watching there. You can find out a little about what our church and what we teach and preach. And you can fill out that connect card right there on our live streaming page. And you can accept Jesus into your life. Maybe you're outside of a church. The church, the doors of the church are open. Perhaps you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You want to come in relationship with this church. You can do so at this time as well. Will you slip your hand up wherever you are? We'll send one of our ministers to you. They'll pray with you. We'll just exchange some brief information after the service. Slip your hand up wherever you are. If you're outside of a relationship with a church, this time's for you. You can do it online. Direct message us on Facebook. Type it in the comments on YouTube. Go to our website. If you're already watching there, fill out that connect card on the live stream page. Slip your hands up wherever you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you what you've spoken to us. Bless these, your people, as they leave this place today. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Give someone a hug on your way out. Yell at that neighbor never again. <laughs>